Hello, happy Thursday. Today you are going to take a ride along with Miss Gittinger and venture into chapter three of Little House in the Big Woods. We're gonna read together today. So Miss Patterson talked about chapter two last. She read the end of chapter two to you. And the exciting part of chapter two was Grandpa's little adventure in the Big Woods and the panther racing after him and screaming in the night. And he was really scared and he was trotting along on his horse and all of a sudden, he jumped off the horse, ran into his cabin, slammed the door shut, and then the panther pounced on the back of, the, of his horse and rode off. And Grandpa grabbed his gun and shot the panther just in time and saved the horse. And so that's where you left off. And Laura always loved to hear stories about Grandpa in the big woods, and she especially loved that story. And she and Mary would sit there and listen to Grandpa, I mean, listen to Paul talk about Grandpa. And she always felt really safe because her Paul was a protector and he knew how to shoot guns and he knew how to hunt. And he knew, she knew she was safe in the little cabin in the big woods with her family. Now chapter three talks about the long rifle. That is the title of chapter three, it's called the long rifle. And it's all about Paul cleaning his gun and making homemade bullets for his gun. There's a real long process to how Paul would carefully clean his gun and he would be very, very safe. Mary and Laura would help him clean his gun and they would bring him items that he needed. And we're gonna read about that in a minute. But, there is something really exciting again that happens in chapter three. And there is a story that Paul tells about Paul in the big woods. He goes on an adventure himself in the big woods and we are going to find out what happens. So let's get started. I'm going to share my screen with you and you will see the Little House book pop up here, and I want you to follow along. But if you have your book, please go get it. Pause this video and go get your book because I would really like for you to follow along in with your book. Okay, so we're on page 45, chapter three, The Long Rifle. Okay, so here we go. Every evening before he began to tell stories, Paul made the bullets for his next day's hunting. Laura and Mary helped him. They brought the big, long-handled spoon and the box full of bits of lead and bullet mold. Then while he squatted on the hearth and made the bullets, they set one on each side of him and watched. First, he melted the bits of lead in the big, oops, I'm sorry. Let me go right back. First, he melted the bits of lead in the big spoon held in the coals. When the lead was melted, he poured it carefully from the spoon into the little hole in the bullet mold. He waited a minute, then he opened the mold and out dropped a bright new bullet onto the hearth. We're gonna stop there for a minute. Do you remember what a hearth is? It's, part, it's the part of a, an old fireplace, usually in older homes. Um, but they have hearths that come out and it's a, it's like a ledge that you sit on. Okay. It's the front of the fireplace that sticks out and you can kind of sit on it by the fire. That's where he is. All right. Now we're on the second paragraph, page 46. The bullet was too hot to touch, but it shone so temptingly, temptingly that sometimes Laura or Mary could not help touching it. Then they burned their fingers. But they did not say anything because Paul had told them never to touch a new bullet. If they burned their fingers, that was their own fault. They should have minded him. So they put their fingers in their mouths to cool them and watched Paul make more bullets. There would be a shiny pile of them on the hearth before Paul stopped. He let them cool. Then with his jackknife, he trimmed off the little lumps left by the hole in the mold. He gathered up the tiny shavings of lead and saved them carefully to melt again the next time he made bullets. 
The finished bullets he put into his bullet pouch. This was a little bag which Ma had made beautifully of buckskin from a buck that Pa had shot. After the bullets were made, Pa would take his gun down from the wall and clean it. Out in the snowy woods all day, it might have gathered a little dampness, and the inside of the barrel was sure to be dirty from gun smoke, from powder smoke. So Pa would take the ramrod from its place under the gun barrel and fasten a piece of clean cloth on its end, and fasten a piece of he stood the butt of the gun in a pan on the hearth and poured boiling water from the tea kettle into the gun barrel. Then quickly he dropped the ramrod in and rubbed it up and down, up and down, while the hot water blackened with powder smoke spurted out through the little hole on which the cap was placed when the gun was loaded. So he kept pouring in more water and washing the gun barrel with the cloth on the ramrod until the water ran out clear. Then the gun was clean. The water must always be boiling so that the heated steel would dry instantly. And that warm water also helped loosen up the little gunpowder granules and it cleaned it, made it more, and washed it right on out. So he needed the warm water. They didn't have microwaves back then, so he couldn't just heat up his water. He had to boil it on the stove first over the fire. All right, we're on the second paragraph. Then Paul put a clean greased rag on the ramrod, and while the gun barrel was still hot, he greased it well on the inside. <clears throat> With another clean greased cloth, he rubbed it all over outside until every bit of it was oiled and sleek. After that, he rubbed and polished the gun stock until the wood of it was bright and shining too. So not only did he clean the inside of the gun, but he cleaned the outside. So it was real shiny and just really clean. Now he was ready to load the gun again and Laura and Mary must help him. Standing straight and tall, holding the long gun upright on its butt while Laura and Mary stood on either side of him, Paul said, you watch me now and tell me if I make a mistake. So they watched very carefully, but he never made a mistake. Laura handed him the smooth, polished cow horn full of gunpowder. The top of the horn was a little metal cap. Paul filled this cap full of gunpowder and poured the powder down the barrel of the gun. And if you look in the picture right here, you see how Paul is holding the gun upright, up against the, um, on the floor, and, um, Right there is the cow horn. And you see, it's actually made out of a cow's horn. And they made those back then to hold things. They were kind of little containers that they would make. And it has a cap on it. She's handing it to her dad. Okay. Then he shook the gun a little and tapped the barrel to be sure that all the powder was together in the bottom. Where's my pouch box? He asked then and Mary gave him the little tin box full of little pieces of greased cloth. Paul laid one of these bits of greasy cloth over the muzzle of the gun, put one of the shiny new bullets on it, and with a ramrod, he pushed the bullet in the cloth down the barrel gun. Okay, let's look in this picture real quick. Um, you see here's the tea kettle where he boiled the hot water and the spoon and you see bullets on the table in the little box where he kept the powder to make the bullets. And you see the pans that he used to melt the metal down to make, and to make the bullets. Then he would pour that metal that was melted down into this little piece right down here in the corner. That was the mold. So he would pour it in there. And if you look closely, um, it has a little circle that kind of a hollowed out circle piece that he would pour it into and then he would close the mold and it would make the bullet. And then he would lay it out and let it dry. Here is the little um, pouch that Ma made out of buckskin from a deer that Paul shot. So he's got all of his little supplies here that he needs. All right, we're in the last sentence. Then he pounded them tightly against the powder 
When he hit them with the ramrod, the ramrod bounced up in the gun barrel and Pa caught it and thrust it down again. He did this for a long time. Next, he put the ramrod back in its place against the gun barrel. Then taking a box of caps from his pocket, he raised the hammer of the gun and slipped one of the little bright caps over the hollow pin that was under the hammer. He let the hammer down slowly and carefully. If it came down quickly, bang, the gun would go off. Now the gun was loaded and Paul laid it on its hooks over the door. When Paul was at home, the gun always lay across those two wooden hooks above the door. Paul had whittled the hooks out of a green stick with his knife and had driven their straight ends deep into holes in the log. Then hooked ends curved upward and held the gun securely. Notice the word whittled, okay, the word whittled right here. Whittled means to kind of scrape off the wood and and carve. It's like when you carve something out of wood. You whittle the wood away, the, the wood pieces away, with a, usually with a knife. And you can make like walking sticks or things like that. Um, so he whittled and made the hooks, carved hooks out so that he could hang the hooks on the door and lay the gun across the hooks. Okay, so it's above the door frame. Last sentence. The gun was always loaded and always above the door so that Paul could get it quickly and easily anytime he needed a gun. When Paul went into the big woods, he always made sure that the bullet pouch was full of bullets and that the tin patch box and the box of caps were with it in his pockets. The powder horn and a small sharp hatchet hung in his belt and he carried the gun ready loaded on his shoulder. He always reloaded the gun as soon as he had fired it, for he said, he did not want to meet trouble with an empty gun. Whenever he shot at a wild animal, he had to stop and load the gun, measure the powder, put it in and shake it down, put in the patch and the bullet and pound them down, and then put a fresh cap under the hammer before he could even shoot it again. When he shot at a bear or a panther, he must kill it with the first shot, a wounded bear or panther could kill a man before he had time to load his gun again. So he had to be quick. But Laura and Mary were never afraid when Paul went alone into the big woods. They knew that he could <clears throat> always kill bears and panthers with the first shot. After the bullets were made and the gun was loaded came storytelling time. Tell us about the voice in the woods, Laura would beg him. Paul crinkled up his eyes at her. Oh no, he said. You don't want to hear about the time I was a naughty little boy. Oh yes, we do, we do, Laura and Mary said. So Paul began. The story of Paul and the voice in the woods. When I was a little boy, not much bigger than Mary, I had to go every afternoon to find the cows in the woods and drive them home. My father told me never to play by the way, but to hurry and bring the cows home before dark, because there were bears and wolves and panthers in the woods. One day I started earlier than usual, so I thought I did not need to hurry. There were so many things to see in the woods that I forgot the dark was coming. There were red squirrels in the trees, chipmunks scurrying through the leaves, and little rabbits playing games together in the open places. Little rabbits, you know, always have games together before they go to bed. I began to play. I was a mighty hunter, stalking the wild animals and the Indians. I played. I was fighting the Indians until the woods seemed full of wild men, and then all at once I heard the birds twittering, good night. It was dusky in the path and dark in the woods. I knew I must get the cows home quickly or it would be black night before they were safe in the barn and I couldn't find the cows. I listened, but I couldn't hear their bells. I called, but the cows didn't come. I was afraid of the dark and the wild beast but I dared not go home to my father without the cows.
so I ran through the woods hunting and calling. All the time the shadows were getting thicker and darker, and the woods seemed larger, and the trees and the bushes looked strange. I could not find the cows anywhere. I climbed up hills looking for them and calling, and I went down into dark ravines, calling and looking. I stopped and listened for the cowbells, and there was not a sound but the rustling of leaves. Then I heard loud breathing and thought a panther was there in the dark behind me. But it was only my own breathing. My bare legs were scratched by the briars, and when I ran through the bushes, their branches struck me. But I kept on looking and calling, Suki, 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 I shouted with all my might. Suki! Right over my head, something asked, Who? My hair stood straight on end. Who, who? The voice said again. And then how I did run. I forgot all about the cows. All I wanted was to get out of the dark woods to go home. That thing in the dark came after me and called again. Hoo-hoo. I ran with all my might. I ran till I couldn't breathe and I still kept on running. Something grabbed my foot and down I went. Up I jumped and then I ran. Not even a wolf could have caught me. At last I came out of the dark woods by the barn. There stood all the cows waiting to be let through the bars. I let them in and then ran to the house. My father looked up and said, Young man, what makes you so late? Been playing by the way? I looked down at my feet and then I saw that one big toenail had been torn clean off. Whoops, I got to the wrong. Let me go down a page. Sorry about that. I had been so scared that I had not felt it hurt until that minute. Paul always stopped telling the story here and waited until Laura said, Go on, Paul, please go on. Well, Paul said, then your grandpa went out to the yard and cut a stout switch. And he came back into the house and gave me a good thrashing so that I would remember to mind him after that. A big boy nine years old is old enough to remember to mind, he said. There's a good reason for what I tell you to do. And if you'll do as you're told, no harm will come to you. Yes, yes, Pa, Laura would say, bouncing up and down on Paul's knees. And then what did he say? He said, if you'd obey me as you should, you wouldn't have been out in the big woods after dark, and you wouldn't have been scared by a screech owl. Oh, and that's the end of chapter three. So in chapter three, we have learned how Paul uh, cleaned his gun and how he carefully placed it in the house so it was out of harm's way, and Laura and Mary could not get to the gun, so it was very, very safe, because only Paul was in charge of the gun, because he knew how to handle it and when to use it, when it was appropriate. And he used it for hunting and protection only. And so, then, the story of Paul in the big woods was very exciting, wasn't it? He disobeyed his Paul, though. If he had not disobeyed, if he had listened, he would not have ever been scared in the big woods because he would have been home by dark, before dark, and he would have had the cows put away. But he got lost in the big woods because he did not listen to his Paul. He did play. He played by the way, like his grandpa said, or his Paul said not to. So it's always important to listen, and that's the lesson of behind uh, chapter three, is that we need to listen and do as we're told because there's always a good reason why 
we're told not to do something, right? Because our parents know best and they know how to keep you safe. So I hope you enjoyed chapter three. Uh, tomorrow we will start um, chapter four, it's called Christmas. So if you have the book, please don't read chapter four yet. Let it be um, something new to you tomorrow when we read it together. Have a wonderful afternoon, boys and girls. I will see you later.